Welcome to the OpEx Effect, a joint podcast from Excess Returns and Spot Gamma, where we take a deep dive into the world of options and the flows they generate in the markets. Join Brent Kachuba, Jack Forehand, and me, Justin Carboneau, every month on the Options Exploration Week as we look at the major developments in the options world and how they impact all of our portfolios. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Lydia Capital. So episode three, Brent. We, we made it to three episodes. Oh, that's a full quarter. <laughs> yeah. But there's something about like, if you if you make it to 10 episodes, you're like in the top 1% of all podcasts. So uh, if, if we get seven more, we're, we're in really good shape. We're just outlasting the, uh, the competition. Yeah. <laughs> That's my thing. You know, I don't try to be better than the other people. I, I just try to listen, stick around longer. Um, and I hope it works in my favor. <laughs> uh, I think evolutionarily, that's how you do it. Yeah, just stick around. <laughs> So it's, it's been pretty exciting since last time. Uh, you know, we, uh, we've had like a pretty massive rally in the market. So I think, we, I think we're gonna have a lot to talk about around that. Yeah, it's been a, uh, it's been a pretty, on the single stock side, it's been very <laughs> exciting. It, on the index side, it's been really rather dull the last two weeks. There was a lot of movement uh, to the start of December and then things really, uh, I guess, in the, into the end of November, I should say, and then things kind of quieted out. But there's a bunch of Incredible catalyst coming up. You got the CPI, you got FOMC. Uh, today we're talking, it is the 11th. So uh, CPI is tomorrow, 12th. Uh, there was a humongous treasury auction today, which seemed to spark a little bit of movement in, in, in equities. Uh, there's VIX expiration the week after that. And there's then all that falls into a really big January options expiration. So an option space and macro space, et cetera, there's, there's a lot going on before we can get to Santa Claus and uh, New Year's Eve. And before we've got a lot to cover, but before we get into that, I just wanted to cover the OPEX cycle in general, because we, we are trying to you know make this podcast for longer term investors, many of which may not understand a lot of what's going on behind the scenes with options. So before we get into all of it, can you just talk about the OPEX cycle and how it works? So this is how we view the options expiration cycle. You can see down here is options expiration, which uh, there's a very large one coming up here on Friday. That's December 15th. And the way that this works is that when options positions expire, uh, the associated hedging flows with these positions also expire. So if you think about uh, a monthly cycle, the third Friday of the month is the biggest options expiration, uh, typically where institutions will place their larger options uh, open interest, they buy their calls and puts. And so as the market moves, hedging flows grow uh, in relation to those options positions. We advance through the days and weeks to the third Friday, the hedging flows grow in kind, and then boom, third Friday of the month, expiration hits. and all that open interest is wiped out and the hedging flows associated with any open interest is also removed. And so that allows stocks to sort of move more freely or it implies at least that the options flows uh, change or switch, right? Because of all these positions expiring. So on Friday, we're gonna have the largest expiration of the year generally uh, for the S&P 500, NASDAQ and Russell, uh, December expiration is generally the biggest. And associated with that has been the fact that the markets really haven't done much over the last 17 or 18 days, realized volatility, which tells us how much the market's been moving uh, over the past month is at an eight, uh, which tells us that the market's moving something like 50 bips a day. That's the S&P 500. So things are very, very quiet because there's been huge call positions that have built up in the S&P 500. Options flows are pinning us down to 4,600. And then on Friday, boom, all these positions get wiped out and hedging flows shift. And I think the market can move around. Uh, and then of course we build into January expiration. So, yeah, and in this in this next slide, you, you sort of show you show the performance of the S and P over time with these expirations, and you can see at times these can be you know significant turning points for the market, um, you know depending on the setup going into it and what happens after. Yeah, and, and that's what's sort of critical is that at times, and the way that we measure at times is we can tell how big positions are, we can estimate how big hedging flows are associated with these various positions, and so each one of these red X's is an options expiration. Many of them come at very significant turning points in the market. Um, you know, some of them are sort of in the middle of a larger trend, and those are generally smaller expirations that don't fall on a quarterly expiration. So the quarterly expirations, like I just mentioned, are the biggest uh, March, June, September, and December tend to be the largest of all expirations. Um, and so, you know, those will often be turning points, but you'll you'll see the market often shift and sort of the, the trend in market can often change around these uh, big expirations. So we're coming into one where we've had, we've had a pretty good run up here. Um, and we've got a pretty large expiration. So does this like put warning bells up a little bit that maybe we've got more of a chance of a turning point here? Yeah, and I think that's what the interesting thing is here is that, you know, our metrics show that it's a very large 
what we call positive gamma expiration. You can see on this chart here that around 4,600, we have what's called very positive gamma in the market. And Goldman, I think, put something out last week that said it was the largest amount of positive gamma they've ever measured in the S&P 500. And what positive gamma essentially means is that dealers are long calls uh, in the S&P 500 in particular. And so what that means is that uh, there's a lot of overriding of calls nowadays. It's a very popular strategy. There's a lot of ETFs like JEPI that specialize in selling calls into the market, S&P calls. So dealers are buying up these calls. And the way that they, they hedge with a positive gamma position is as the market goes up, specifically the S&P goes up, they sell futures or they sell stock into those rallies. And then as the market comes down, they buy stock back. And so you can imagine that the more of this hedging flow they have to do, the more constrained the market gets, right? Because they're huge sellers now as the market moves up a little bit. They're big buyers as the market moves down. And that really, like a Chinese finger trap, kind of tightens you up uh, and makes you very sticky around these areas where there's big call positions. So 4,600 today is just the, the beast of levels right now. Uh, 416 spider is also huge. And you can see the market just really kind of congeals in and around that general area. And again, about 30% plus of this position is going to be wiped out on Friday. So those hedging flows that keep the market trapped should go away as well. And that really allows us to move into the end of the year. So I want to ask you about this idea, like people talk about this idea of dispersion a lot, which is like when the market's pinned at a certain level, like you can get, if one thing moves, like the other one, I think has to move in the opposite direction to keep it pinned. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, generally the idea with, and you see this, I think even more now, I would argue than, than I've noticed in the past is that with dispersion trades, the idea is that you could sell or buy index options and then buy or sell single stock options. And the idea is that you're betting that the two would move, uh, the volatility of the two would move in a different way, right? So I could sell SPX, let's say calls or something and use that to buy mag seven calls, uh, you know, Microsoft or Tesla or something like that. And what you see is that the S and P is getting really pinned, right? But single stocks are really making a lot of moves. And, you know, that was something that this idea of correlation, for example, uh, there's a SIBO puts out a metric called the correlation metric C O R one M. And that shows you S and P 500 implied volatility versus a single stock implied volatility. Basically, how much is the index moving relative to stocks? And stocks were just moving a lot more, uh, in particular back in June and July, where we had kind of a blow off top, right? Those in, in AI stocks were really going crazy. And that's starting to percolate again now, where you could almost essentially fund long option trades in single stocks by selling uh, S&P options for, for kind of a succinct uh, explanation. Yeah, it's interesting because it doesn't necessarily, just because the market's pinned doesn't mean you necessarily have like lack of excitement. Like behind the scenes, yeah, right. uh, you can still have some excitement in the individual names behind the scenes, um, even though the market's going nowhere. Yeah, 100%. Uh, S&P has been very you know, boring. We could show some charts of that, but you know, like I'm looking at AMD today, I think is up, uh, what is that? Three, 4%. Avgo up 10%. Macy's is up 20% today. So there's a lot of stuff that's moving. Uh, everything is moving up. Um, even though the, you know, the S and P kind of is, is a little bit lackluster today. So, um, just to put a little bit of proof behind this idea of gamma supporting volatility or, or leading to changes in volatility, this is our gamma index. So we measure how much gamma is in the market along the X axis. Uh, and the larger the gamma figure is, what you see is there's less volatility in the S and P 500. So the Y axis there is volatility. And so. Right now, we're about a 1.5 on our index. And so you can see those scattered plots there. It's a very tight band, right? Uh, and that tight band, th these types of readings, 1.5 on our gamma index, come with large amounts of calls in the market. When things get uglier under the hood and put positions start to fill into the market, our gamma index goes more towards zero, towards the left of this chart. And you can see the dispersion of data there, the, vol the volatility of the market starts to really expand quite a bit. And so we can predict how much gamma is going to be in the market in you know, a fairly short-term basis in days and, and even weeks. And so in theory, we know that, hey, the options gamma is about to change like it is on Friday because of the fact that all these calls are going to expire. So therein, our gamma index should slide down and volatility should increase. Um, and that's really what's coming up. That's what we're facing here. Now, What's interesting is that I, I think we could move up or down quite a bit. We have FOMC to, on Wednesday, I think, that determines that. But the idea of volatility expanding 
from this point feels like a pretty safe call given the fact that S and P has been pretty dull, right? And there's a bunch of catalysts, and then you know you have all these options clearing. So um, the GAM index's ability to help forecast short-term volatility uh, it's been a great tool for us. And and again, we print out this GAM index around three in the morning, and it predicts or forecasts the next day's amount of volatility. So it's not a this is not a a backwards looking uh, indicator; it's a forward looking indicator. I'm just curious curious of this pinning idea and low volatility. Like, could could you have a situation where something happens to the FOMC, but the reaction is sort of delayed a little bit because of this until after OPEX? I mean, could something like that happen? I think that's very true. If you look at the non-farm payrolls number, for example, on Friday, uh, you know, everybody was super excited for that. Implied volatility, so the options market was pricing a little bit more movement, uh, but ultimately just did nothing, right? We were just locked, you know, into the same levels we were. Um, and I think that when we approach CPI tomorrow, it could be the same thing, right? CPI could move the market a little bit, but it's facing all of these hedging flows that are really going to lock in. Um, and and as you advance, like you said, the Powell on uh, Wednesday, the options market is not in a position yet to induce volatility. There are times that it is, and, and right now it's not. So, you know, the in theory, it's like whatever Powell says does it unlock enough non-options flows to overwhelm the hedging flows that exist in the market. It's a tremendous amount of hedging flows. We find that hedging positions start to shift around kind of Wednesday, Thursday into Friday. So Powell's going to kind of tick off or, or kick off, I should say, uh, the start of, I think, positions starting to move and switch a little bit. Uh, but I do think that volatility into the event will be muted based on the, the current positioning in the options market. I always remember back to COVID when I think about that idea, because I remember like COVID was in China, it was getting in Italy. And I was looking at it, I'm like, why the hell is the market not going down? Like, and it wasn't going down. And then we had OPEX and like, it just completely imploded. So like that, maybe that was another example of like, it was getting pinned for a while. And then once OPEX came, it was clear to go. Yeah, there was a, there were, to your point, there was a, a, a tremendous amount of positive gamma back then in February, 2020. And the market really fell apart the Monday after that, that, February options expiration. So it was like uh, Feb op options expired on Friday. And then on Monday, things really fell apart. And then actually the low of, of 2020 was the March expiration, uh, the Monday after March options expiration. So we had huge puts expiring in March. Um, and, and so the low of the market was the Monday after that. So, you know, that, that, that's a great window of analogy. I mean, it's incredible how much the market fell in that one month period, but that was completely bookended by these two expirations. Um, so that, you know, that was a, a really amazing period. And you can see other times like that, you know, June of 2022, where the market low was at expiration. Um, you know, there's a, there's a whole bunch of other times where significant, you know, kind of historical, for lack of a better term, uh, reversal, reversions were, uh, reversals, reversals, excuse me, uh, were made. I was thinking you, you were talking about like uh, put selling before, and I was just thinking about like, it's been in the news a lot more recently, this whole short volatility trade and how it's picking up again. And, and maybe it's getting back to like dangerous levels or something like that. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, is that, first of all, is that contributing to sort of the muted volatility? And, and is there like a danger on the other side of that? Yeah. I, you know, markets are reflexive in that the behavior or for the P&L of trades, you know, when, when trades are working, the size of the kind of assets or whatever that are tied to those trades, I think increases, right? So if you're short vol and that's working, you continue to short vol um, and that kind of feeds on itself a little bit and grows in size. And the problem with the short volatility trade is that there's a lower bound for volatility, right? It can go to zero, <laughs> but that's it. And so you start to get in this point where I mentioned before that realized vol in the S&P 500 is an eight. Um, and, and so you're saying, hey, the S&P 500, you know, could move 50 basis points a day. That's not very much. And so if you get a move that's 75 basis points or 1%, right, in the S&P, then suddenly anyone who's short volatility, uh, betting on 50 basis points or less of movement in the S&P, as soon as you get just a little bit of movement, then suddenly that could cause people to have to cover uh, and that could really shift things, right? The other problem, you know, with this is that we're in this Goldilocks phase of, of markets where you know, I, I think people are betting on soft landing and stocks are going crazy and there may or may not be rate cuts. I mean, the projections there are flipping all around. And so, you know, the, the market is really priced for perfection when you get to these levels where, you know, this isn't the VIX at 20 you can go to 15, right? We're talking the VIX at 12 and what's it going to do? Go to like eight or nine, like historically kind of low levels. 
um, there's very little room for error here, right? And, and the error is that people are not only, so if you talk about, am I hedged for a downside? Well, rather than being ready for hedge for downside, you first have to cover your short put trade, right? To get flat. And then you'd have to buy options or buy puts in order to hedge yourself. So there's kind of like two parts to the cycle of what would have to happen if there was a lot of risk that comes out in the market. I think typically you get a warning shot first, which allows people to kind of cover and move. But, you know, look, you, you keep, you stay in a trade until it stops working. Um, and right now, short volatility is, is working. It's, it, Arguably been working pretty well since 2022. Um, and so it, it draws more more attention. Yeah, what always seems to happen with things like that is, A, they always go on a lot longer than you think they're going to. So like I remember in 2017, you were, I was sitting here being like, there's no way volatility will be this low for this long. It just keeps going and going and going. And then eventually when it blows up, it like blows up, you know, it, it can blow up dec in a decent size. Yeah. So it was interesting, like 17 and 18 was, was an example of that type of thing. Although I know we don't have those same type of VIX products uh, out there now uh, that we're well, there then. I mean, you, you, you could argue that we do. I mean, there's other ways to, to UVXY, BXX and SBXY, these short vol products are still there. They're launching a, I think it's a 4X, XXXX, uh, long S&P product, I think it is. I saw that. So, you know, these, these derivative ETFs are, kind of invading the market again. Realized volatility in late summer of 2017 got to, I think, 3.4, 3.5, if I remember correctly. Uh, that's the lowest it's ever been. And so we're, you know, at an eight or nine right now, um, which that sounds like there's a large spread there, but it's really not. If you use this thing called rule of 16, if you divide the implied volatility by 16, it tells you what roughly what the one day moves move is, right? So, you know, if you have a 12 realized vol or a 12 VIX, that's saying, okay, we have, you know, 75 basis points to roughly a daily moving SP, which I think is somewhat healthy or reasonable. If you start to get down into betting that the market's going to move 50 basis points or less, right? If you divide eight by 16, then, then you're starting to get into this area where there's just very, very little room for error. And then not only that, if the market can move up 50 basis points or 75 basis points and also hurt those short volatility players. So, that's something that I think could actually happen here at a year end, right? There, it could cause a scramble to the upside because short vol traders have to cover, right? It, it, volatility works both ways. Yeah, you actually had an interesting slide on this idea of this, this terminal volatility slide. Um, your next slide, you're talking about your estimated move versus the VIX. Can you just yeah, talk so about what you see there? If we look at that gamma index, this one here, right? We, we take that gamma index and we forecast a daily move. So 55 basis points is our daily move. That's what you see here in blue. Uh, and if you're listening to this on podcast number one thanks for listening on the podcast but number two what you would see in this slide is that we are at what i call terminal volatility and terminal volatility means we just can't go any lower there's a well-known saying in options land that low volatility doesn't make it cheap but we know that i've seen one or two readings maybe around 52 basis points in my four plus years of looking at this metric so 55 basis points are as our expected move is very low and you can also see the VIX here is hitting multi-year lows down around 12, 12 and a half. Uh, VIX today is at 12.7. And that's two days before FOMC and a day before the CPI number or whatever else. So there's catalysts that are coming up. This options expiration is coming up. Options expiration is going to make our volatility metric go up. And so we believe that should make the VIX kind of respond in kind, right? Or market volatility respond in kind. So terminal volatility is this idea that we've hit this lower bound. VIX you know, in volatility, it can't go much lower, right? Because markets are going to open, the exchanges are going to turn on, something is going to move around a little bit. Uh, you know, zero is not an option. Um, we could stay at very low levels, but I don't think that's realistic given end of year flows, expiration, FOMC, and all this other stuff. Is there decent volatility priced in at all for like FOMC and CPI or is it, is it really, really low there too for those days? It's really pretty low. I think that, you know, some people would argue that zero DT options allow people to sort of hedge out events now. And that has a, an effect of reducing the VIX or longer term uh, volatility. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the VIX is based on the price of 30 day S&P 500 options. So, you know, historically, if you want to hedge event, you buy a one month option and that would make the VIX go up, right? Well, now if you buy a zero DTE option, even if there's a tremendous amount of demand there, uh, that's not going to get into VIX pricing at all. So some people think, hey, the VIX is dead. Uh, and I think on a daily basis, that's probably true. When we saw stuff like the bank crisis, suddenly there becomes demand for longer dated options, right? Because 
people want to hedge out these events that are unknown. Um, you can't, you know, banks were going bankrupt, right? You couldn't put a date, specific date on when the next bank would, would go bankrupt. So you had to buy a longer dated option, right? You couldn't buy the zero DTE because that only covers you for today. But obviously with the CPI or FMC, you can hedge that out arguably with the zero DTE option. And so some people think that that really has a dampening effect on longer term volatility. But volatility across the spectrum, if you look at term structure, uh, is, is how we'd measure that. It, it's very low right now. People just aren't pricing in much risk to markets at all. Was there something, I may be wrong about this, was there something I read that like the best returns from shorting volatility come when it's low or something like that? Is that right? Well, but, I mean, the, the thing with volatility and what makes it so attractive for people to trade is that it's inherently mean reverting, right? You have huge volatility spikes and if the VIX goes to 50 or 80 or whatever it may be, um, you know, you know the VIX is going to come back down. It may not come back all the way down to where it was, but it can't sustain 80, you know, an 80 VIX. So the the rough idea is that there's this reflexivity, obviously, in markets where low volatility begets lower volatility uh, and, and volatility starts to increase it's like an echo, you know, things kind of pick up uh, or, or sort of shockwave, I guess you should say. And so, you know, there's a interesting data out by Nomura and he calls, you know, put selling right now has like the best sharp ratio of anything he's ever seen, right? Uh, because it's just worked so well, just continuously selling puts in this market because the market goes up and ball goes down and both of those hammer uh, put values. And it becomes a perfect trade until volatility gets to where arguably it is now. Um, and then really, if you start to sell puts at this point, you're more betting that the market's going to go up as opposed to volatility is really going to go a whole lot lower, if, if that makes sense. Um, it, I would argue too that you're not really getting paid very much the longer you do this trade, right? Because the lower VIX goes or the lower volatility goes, the less options are worth. And so you continuously sell options. Hey, the put I used to sell for a dollar, I can only sell for 50 cents, but I'll do it anyways. And then I can only sell for 25 cents, but I'll do it anyways. And then the risk reward just gets to be pretty crappy. Um, and and that's kind of what ultimately I think fed into the Volmageddon situation was, you know, people bet on volatility lower, 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 and lower. And, and then suddenly, you know, all that, that volatility bet crammed sort of risk into a box, right? And then as soon as there was a little bit of trigger or, or demand for volatility, then there was an explosion, right? Because there was all this pressure that was built up and all these people had to run for cover because they were shorting volatility at very low levels. Yeah. The issue was in that case, like there wasn't much time to get out the door, basically. You know, you, if you weren't out ahead of it, like you're, you're in huge trouble. Yeah. I mean, that's another say, saying, not to, not to glom on all those things here, but risk happens fast, right? And I think that this is the challenge of, of trading in general is, is okay, yeah, uh, volatility is too low. I get it, but it may stay low for a week, 10 days, two weeks, a month. I mean, if 2017 for the whole year, right? Um, I, I, you know, I'm not convinced that this is an environment that, that this happens. We can, have a, we can have a quick VIX move to 15 over the, you know, FOMC, blah, blah, blah. And then suddenly, you know, we hit Christmas and New Year's and everyone's back to sleep anyways, right? So it's a, it's a tricky period for this. Um, which makes zero DT options attractive here because I'll hedge CPI today and tomorrow, and then I'm going to go, you know, on Christmas and holiday and then come back in January and then, then maybe some fireworks pick up. So you talked about the big upcoming expiration and this next slide, uh, illustrates that you, you can see the size of it relative to all the other ones coming up. Yeah, there's two things to note here. Number one, this is a gamma by expiration and, and, uh, December expiration, we calculate roughly $800 billion of calls in the S and P. It's just the S and P are set to expire. Uh, that's a massive number. That big number is part of what's crushing volatility right now. Cause these are long calls that have to be hedged by dealers that again, we think leads to suppressing or making the S&P stick to this 3,600 area. The other thing to note is the imbalance here, right? Because orange is calls and that's 800 billion, let's call it. And then blue is puts and there's only 130 billion of puts expiring on a relative basis. So this is a huge call heavy expiration. Historically, uh, if you look at the data in 2020, 2021, generally we had a big imbalance in calls that would lead to the market selling off after expiration as calls aren't allowed. Uh, I was looking at the data last night. Um, I didn't include in the slide because quite frankly, I want to do a little bit more analysis on it, but that OPEX effect or that mean reversion effect seems to have really waned this year and arguably since October of last year. 
Um, what's so funny about that is that's when zero DT ops was launched. So it's a little pet theory that I have that I need to do some more investigation on, but something I'm really looking at. Cause in theory, what I normally would say is that, Hey, all these calls expiring should lead to weakness in the market. Uh, cause it's such a big call, heavy expiration. I'm still on that train. The data used to heavily support that. It seems to support it a little bit less right now, but given that volatility is pretty low, you know, you got to factor in Powell here. Um, I, I do think that that this is a period where we could see a little bit of a pullback in markets, uh, which could play still into a year-end rally. I, I just think right now that the the market is very lean one way and, and generally needs to kind of consolidate a little here. So two takeaways are massive expiration, huge options expiring that should lead to volatility. Volatility could go either way, uh, but also it's a very call-heavy uh, expiration, which which is the second kind of takeaway from this slide. Could part of what you like, what you're expecting not happening as much anymore, could that be people knowing it? Like people expecting what's going to happen and it's get, it gets priced in because people understand, you know, that this is a thing now? I think, you know, um, I would say yes to that because, look, I started doing this in January of 2020 and I spent every day convincing people that there was hedging flows and that moved stocks and and people didn't want to buy into that on an institutional level down to the retail level, right? And then 2021 meme mania hits and suddenly everyone's like, yeah, options move, you know, <laughs> stocks. And so, you know, the idea, you know, that these options flows are big, they're meaningful. Gamma squeeze is a normal term for every trader, even if you don't touch options. Um, so I, I do think there's a, a bit of that. I also think that, you know, look, if, if Guys like Citadel are extremely smart. I think they know all, what all the positioning is in the market. And I think that they can, you know, position themselves to, to do what the market doesn't expect, right? Because if it, a crowded trade going against somebody, uh, you know, they're going to continuously do the same thing. Kind of like JP Morgan Collar, which I know we want to talk on. Um, that doesn't seem to have the same effect to markets, at least on the day of or, or short-term basis. Because I think it gets hedged out differently because there, there's so much eyes on it. So, I do think there is a little bit of that effect. I also do think that zero DT options allow uh, exposures to get hedged. Because, you know, look, if you're heading into this expiration as a market maker and you know that you have $800 million of calls expiring or whatever it may be, right? Uh, and, and, you know, some stuff is in the money. So is it going to be assigned on Saturday? And what are my positions? A lot of times I don't think you fully understand until really maybe even Monday morning what your exposure is, right? Um, and so before, I think that used to lead to these hedging unwinds on Monday morning uh, or Monday afternoon. And and now I think you can buy some zero DTEs and you could pretty much calculate what your risk is and you know your risk reward of hedging that with very short dated options. And maybe that takes out a lot of the delta that would be traded, so to speak, or futures or stock being traded because you could just hedge it out with with zero DTEs now, right? Uh, so maybe that, you know, that's my favorite theory as to maybe why the impact is changing. So you mentioned the JP Morgan trade. Can you just explain what that is? Because I, you hear a lot of talk in the market about, I think there's like two strike prices associated with it and people say it'll pin at one or the other. Like, but I, I guess you're saying it's not as much of an impact as it used to be. Yeah. So the, the JP Morgan collar trade is a fund is driven by a fund that holds a bunch of large single stock positions and they put on this collar once a quarter. Uh, they put it on the end of the month, so that position is going to roll on December 30th. And basically what they do is they sell a 2 to 3% out-of-the-money call, and then they use those proceeds to buy a put. Uh, and they're, In this case, they generally buy 40 or 45,000 puts. It's a big trade. <clears throat> and so um, that hedges their equities in theory, right? You, you sell the call in order to buy the put. Um, and that call that they sold is at 45,000. So... Uh, excuse me, 4,500 in the S&P, 4,515 to be specific. So that's deep in the money right now by about 100 points, 100 handles in the S&P. Um, and the idea and the the theory is that, and you can see that trade is here, right? This orange bar is a big part of that trade is in this orange bar. It's a call position that's not deep in the money. So the theory was that as we get to closer to that expiration, that, that position is like a magnet and these hedging flows will move us into that level. Um that used to be a very sticky level, I would say, in 2021. And then in 2022, you can make some argument. And then in 2023, it seems like the market doesn't pay a whole lot of attention to it anymore. And its ability, the ability for the, for the S&P to kind of pin to that level, you know, into the days around uh, those expirations, doesn't seem to have the same effect. 
I think that's because there's so much eyes on it. It's such a widely discussed trade that whoever the hedging broker is likely changed the way that they hedge to account for the fact that the market had been really watching this thing. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting with stuff like that. It's like, you know, it becomes the next big thing and, and everybody's talking about it and then it slowly like weans off. Like I'm not hearing, like for this quarter, I'm not hearing about that nearly as much, you know, and I'm not in the option space, but I am on Twitter and I'm not hearing about it nearly as much as I was, you know, a year and a half ago. I mean, I mean it's, it, it, it's, I, I think that there are effects of it on the market, particularly as you get closer to expiration. You know, if there's any weakness after Powell comes out and we get in the 4,500 area, then that should add to the market being a little more sticky at 4,500. 4,500 is also a very large level in any ways in the S&P. There's a lot of other positions expiring there. And, you know, it's a it's kind of a nice round number that people will watch. So, look, if we're around 4,500, let's call it, you know, above 4,400, but under 4,600 in the week before expiration, this is 1229 expiration, then then it could have some effect. But right now, that, that position is very deep in the money. And the other thing is that the number of other ETFs and, and positions that sell options has increased significantly. Interestingly, there's an ETF called JEPI, J-E-P-I, which is the largest ETF, I believe, in the U.S. right now. It has over, I believe, $30 billion under management, give or take a couple billion is counting. Uh, and that space in general has grown massively. Wall Street Journal did an article today. They point out that over $60 billion is now is so tied to these options uh, selling strategies. Um, and that JEPI fund just sells every week. They sell 30 day options. So, you know, they, they ladder into these calls that are being sold in the S and P 500. So that's adding just additional positions onto this JP Morgan collar trade. Right. Um, and in theory, that's that flow, that selling of calls is dampening volatility because, you know, that's the positive gamma trade that's helping to build up what we see on our screen in a lot of ways. Um, that really s smothering, uh, s p volatility one could argue um and the strategies are very popular I, I think there's some that feel that uh on a total return basis they're very bad strategies you know selling calls but they provide this income and or security that a lot of people like and find attractive and um you know so so they so they're growing and, and gaining in assets and, and they'll be selling more options as a result particularly calls so we do a what's moving segment every week, but uh, where you find some things you've seen interesting in the options market. But before we do that, we got to talk about the what's moving second section from last time. So what's moved? Um, yeah. And I know last time we talked a lot about the Mag Seven. Um, we started out. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that you know we do a lot of podcasts. We don't spend a lot of time on like how do we do from the last episode. And I thought that for people, you know, we hopefully people get a flavor for what our calls were like from the last OPEX to this one. So you could see as a longer term investor, you know, were these effects meaningful, right? Did they matter? And it gives us a little scorecard. Uh, so far, our scorecard has been all right, thankfully, knock on wood. Uh, I'm not looking forward to the day where we just, we were horrible and wrong and everything, but we'll see. That'll be like my annual, my annual market forecast, which is always uh, completely horrible and wrong. I mean, I kind of do it as a joke, but uh, it is all, it is often horrible and wrong. I'm looking forward to read that. There's some wild <laughs> ones out there uh, right now. Um, and you're, listen, you get more attention by making extreme, so uh, extreme calls. Yeah, did, did you see that, by the way, that guy like that uh, that was going around Twitter, like that guy who had for every YouTube podcast he did, like the cover was just something on fire. And it was like hell coming, like the world is going to end. Like every, every video he did was the same exact cover, just with fire burning and like some catastrophe that was about to come. So yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I think it's like the rich dad, Robert, whatever his name is. He's been calling for a market crash every year for... And that's the funny thing, though, is that eventually the market crashes. You're like, see, I told you, but you've been calling it for seven years, right? So it's the broken clock. So if this, uh, if this podcast doesn't work out the traditional way, we'll just go that direction. We'll have a picture of Brent with like fire and we'll just have fire. you making making crazy calls from the options market and we'll, we'll see what, if that works out for the us. podcast set, it's just a bunch of fires and we'll just sit in the middle of it and <laughs> say bad things about the market. <laughs> Uh, all right. So in November, we saw a couple of things. Mag seven was bid. Um, if you check the tape, we talked about the fact that there were call buyers in the mag sevens. The mag seven index is, uh, we, we measure it with this MGK, which is this Vanguard growth index, you know, look, Apple doing well and Nvidia not too well, but if you measure that basket as a whole, this mag sevens, it's up 2% since November OPEX, not bad. Uh, IWMs and call small caps. we talked a lot about those and that there's a lot of puts set to expire in November. Um, IWMs are up five and a half percent. Um, as of yesterday, today, they are, I think, adding on another little smidge. 
Uh, they're up, yeah, slightly. There's some more to talk about the IWM space. Crypto, we were saying, hey, this looks poised for a breakout based on call positions. Well, crypto went bananas. Uh, Bitcoin hit 45,000. If you look at Coinbase, uh, MSTR, apparently the GDP of Ecuador, because they own so many Bitcoins, it's all, <laughs> it's all going nuts. Um, isn't it Ecuador that buys all the Bitcoin? It's, uh, yeah, it was, it was one of the countries in Latin America. I forget which one it was. I guess it doesn't help their GDP, but anyways, uh, we'll just roll with the joke. And then our last one, we said that we thought that the SPX would rally in the 4,500 to 4,550 area. This is definitely the one that we did not get right as the S&P is now at 4,620 as we read this today. All right, so here's the chart of the MAG7s. You can see here's OPEX and, and you know, it bounced higher. There's a little consolidation. We bounced higher again. We're choppy-ish at these current levels in the MAG7s. And, and what's interesting, for example, if you look today at the semis, NVIDIA is down um, pretty sharply today, 2%-ish. Uh, but you have Avgo, AMD, uh, and some of these other semis are really ripping, and the SMH is up quite a bit. And so it's an interesting moment, I think, for catch-up and some of these kind of second-tier names. And I'll touch on that in a second. Again, here's the chart of the small caps. Just a huge move higher there, uh, as you can see. Uh, we still like IWMs up to the 190-ish area. Uh, and then lastly, here's a chart of uh, Coinbase. And you can see that, you know, it was mid-trend at November options expiration. Uh, but these call buyers really did pretty well. MSTR is a fascinating stock to look at. Uh, MicroStrategy, that gentleman owns just, I think they bought even more Bitcoin. I guess that ETF. It basically just is Bitcoin at this point, right? All right. Yeah. Well, yeah, Bitcoin going up. But that, that was interesting is you saw the buying and options, um, and those are, there were large positions, right? So institutions kind of betting that there was going to be some kind of a move here, right? Um, which I thought was really fascinating because you don't buy Coinbase unless you think crypto is going up. So, um, you know, the, these three names really had pretty big OPEX driven moves. And then, you know, last one was we thought that 4,500, 4,550 would be where we were into December options expiration. You know, this morning, as or right now, as we talk, S and P's forty six eighteen. So we think it's slightly overbought. We have CPI tomorrow, FOMC, uh, obviously on Wednesday. You can see how tight this range is, right? I mean, really, from the twenty second specifically, even into today, uh, the daily range has been extremely tight. It's been a really range bound market over the last seventeen or eighteen sessions, um, as volatility has really just kind of collapsed, and so. You know, th this is at, we think this is over now, this really tight range. So uh, what is moving? Now we'll start looking forward. We've done our kind of quick review here. We start with those small caps. Uh, on your screen here is call open interest. This is from Goldman. Um, and they show us that, look, huge open interest in the IWM calls. Uh, and we think these are a lot of long call buyers looking for the IWM and small caps to catch up. Like if rates are indeed going to pause or the environment is a little more friendly uh, from a rate perspective, then look, the mag sevens are maybe fully valued. And so some of this, you know, dash for trash stuff could pick up a little bit uh, for lack of a better term. And not only that is the call open interest uh, large. Here's the spread you can see um, just on the, over the short term. So, you know, ideal on the left-hand axis there. They could easily, I think, outpace the S&P here into year end. Um, and that's my favorite trade is long IWMs and short spiders. Uh, I like doing that with calls because um, look at Palo upsets the market. If you sold spider calls and bought IWM calls, then everything goes to expires worthless, no harm, no foul. But IWMs should outperform the upside in my view. Is there yeah. is there a risk associated with like the huge expiration there? Like that chart was pretty scary. Like if you look at that, like the, it seems like the most open interest like of all time or something like that. Um, does that yeah. make it prone to a reversal after OPEX? I think that if you look at the breakdown of these positions, they, they're they not super concentrated in the short term. There's a fair amount in, in December. Um, there's a chart that I did not include. If you look at IWM, what we call SKU, uh, for 30 days expiration, et cetera, there's, a, there's an, what we call a call SKU. What call SKU means is that 5% or 10% out of the money calls in the IWM uh, have a higher relative price than the, the puts, the the five or ten percent of the money puts. Usually, don't see that. Usually, calls are not as highly valued as the rel uh, as the relative put, right? So, a call skew tells us that 
there's a bid to calls in IWMs, and there's a higher bid to calls right now than what we've seen in the last at least 60 days, arguably if not longer. And so that tells me that there's people that are long calls. So dealers are short calls in the IWM. What does that mean? Well, if the market starts to go up and you're short calls, you have to buy stock to hedge yourself. And as the stock continues to go up, you have to buy more stock. And so that could create a relative chase. Um, you are correct in that this expiration is going to ding this pretty good, but there's still enough open interest here uh, that if we do rally kind of a year in rally, I, I think that IWMs uh, will outperform. And, and not only that, if we do pause rates or or Powell gives just sort of the indication that the coast is clear in the near term, then then that idea that IWMs need to catch up, I think maybe gains a little bit more traction, right? Um, yeah, it was certainly, it certainly appears the options market is, is leaning very long here, uh, at this point. Yeah. I was listening to your, uh, Twitter, uh, live thing you did with Imran today. And you guys were talking about like, we're not seeing outrageous, crazy call buying though. You know, we're not seeing like GameStop or anything here. Yes. And the way that we look at this is the, um, the, there's a couple of ways. Number one, we look at implied volatilities like SKUs and, and SKUs are not all that crazy really indicating that there's an excessive call demand. Uh, on your screen here is put call ratio for equities only. So a lot of times people include index flow in their equity put call or in their put call ratios. And that adds noise, particularly in the zero DT world that we live in now. So this is simply single stock put call ratios. And what you can see is, yes, we are in a fairly bullish stance. Um, I'd call this mid range, right? This we're well off of the call heavy period of June of this year or any period of 2021, right? Uh, which is interesting because the S&P is now at the same level as where we were basically in December of 2021. MAG-7 is kind of in that same area. Uh, but the calls, you know, it's hard to say that this is a call frenzy right now. If something sparks a call frenzy, then I guess we're going to all-time highs in, in a lot of stocks. But right now, we're not leaning super heavy on the calls. Uh, on single stock side, which I which I think is interesting again because there has been a lot of strong moves over the last couple of days and a lot of different names. Um, I'm it just, doesn't feel like a mania to me right now. I'm just curious, what happened with GameStop? I mean, could that happen again to that degree, or, or are people kind of wise to that and it could never happen? Like, because that was really crazy. I mean, that got like completely out of control. Like, is that something that could happen again, or, or no? No, no, um, not to that level. And I think the reason is because no one in January of 2021 thought that that could happen. Uh, and, it, and if you think about the perfect storm that led to that, not only was, you know, we had the pandemic, so everyone was locked inside, everyone had the stimulus checks and, you know, was focused on the market because there wasn't anything else to do. And, and no one thought that retail in particular would come in and pay these crazy prices for options because institutions would have done that, right, by and large. So now I think and this is an effect that you see in the market is that when something starts to move, the, the prices of calls are adjusted higher so much faster that it snuffs out the move, right? Because if you're a dealer or market maker, you have to provide a bidder offer to the market. That's what your job is as a market maker. It doesn't mean you have to provide a price that people like, you know? Uh, we always use that analogy that if someone put a gun to my head and said, hey, Brent, you have to sell your house. And I said, well, you know, or you have to put your house on the market and I didn't want to move. I'd price my house at 5 million bucks or 10 million bucks, right? Um, where, hey, if someone wanted to pay that, okay, fine. But, uh, you know, I don't really want to trade it. So you do the same with the calls, right? If, you, if you're trading a dollar for a 5% out of the money call today, we'll just charge 10 bucks for that out of the money call, 5% uh, call, and, and no one will trade it. Um, and not only that, it incentivizes call sellers then because they go, oh, that price is really high. And that starts to relieve exposure, right? Because everyone's buying calls and you price calls really high. And people come in and say, oh, I'll sell those now. It, it reduces your exposure. It reduces risk. And that reaction function, how fast call prices are elevated, has increased you know, a lot faster now. It's, it's kind of like, to your point, you know, they're hip to the game at this point. Um, it's hard to get a jump on on these guys now. Yeah, it's interesting. Those types of things are, are got to be really tough like for somebody to try to trade. I mean, if you think about it, like the people that were, there were probably people selling you know, those calls like way, way, way too early thinking like this could never go further and it got completely out of control. But then at the top, you know, it was like, there's no potential move that could even happen that would justify like the prices people were probably paying. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, you know, you could look at the 50 strike puts in GameStop at the peak mania, implied volatility is 400, which is just unbelievable. And I remember that 50 strike puts were trading for $45. Um, which was basically like, cause vol had gone so crazy. You, you basically, you can't, 
you essentially can't lose then there, right? Like the company would have to go bankrupt and they're only like three months out. They weren't, it wasn't like, you know, five year out options or anything. So, you know, the, the implied ball just got so unbelievably crazy. And part of that is because when you, when the VIX is spiking because markets are crashing or, or volatility is spiking because markets are crashing, there's a lower bound there, right? There's zero, like the stock can go to zero, but that's it. So if th there's terminal volatility there to the downside. But in theory, something could go up in, you know, to infinity, right? There's no, there's no upper bound that exists. Yeah, you can have valuations or this and that, but really there's no theoretical limit to the price of, of something going to the upside, right? So, so that volatility could really go extra high in the face of a higher market. Yeah, sorry, I got us a little off track there, but I think that's really interesting. Like for people, it's a good way to understand options to kind of understand what happened with GameStop because you saw a lot of these effects like in like in a heavily magnified um, with what happened there. But uh, yeah, that's that, that that that's exactly right. And so you know we uh, we're we're not likely to see anything like that again. Implied volatility, for example, in you know in GameStop, I think peaked around four four hundred fifty. I want to say somewhere in that neighborhood. Coinbase, you know, which would it have a twenty something point move here? Uh, no, sorry, sixty point move here. So stock almost doubled in the last month, right? Implied volatility at Coinbase is like an eighty. So that puts puts into perspective how crazy GameStop was because you know this this stock doubled in two three weeks. Coinbase did, and it's an eighty vol, uh, and GameStop was a four hundred fifty vol back in the heat of the battle. So that gives you a little bit of uh, of perspective there. So in this next slide, you're talking about uh, you're showing the expirations again, but now we're showing them from a single stock perspective um, yeah. instead of SPX. So what do you see here? This is where things get, I think, particularly interesting for those with a little bit of a longer term view. We're we're the argument I'm trying to make now or here is that we're we're, we're done pinning, right? We're hitting CPI, we're hitting FOMC, we're going to hit uh, options expiration. So there's going to be a release of volatility. We're gonna we're gonna rally, you know, a good, I think, a good three percent or <clears> three percent, excuse me, or we'll, or we'll decline. I think a similar amount. That that volatility is set to expand. And we showed the big S and P expiration before, and you know, it's a big index expiration. On this chart is single stock expirations only. So purple is calls and teal is puts. So it's a big expiration for December here, as you can see for, you know, Tesla, Apple, et cetera. But January is a beast. It is a huge expiration. This is because of all the leap trading that takes place. So there's a lot of wealth managers, Nancy Pelosi, we always talk about in this trade because she buy long dated calls. <clears throat> you know, if you want to bet on or allocate long equity exposure to your portfolio for next year, you have to buy January's calls for 2025, right? Because those are the can't believe it's 2025 is insane, uh, a year away. Anyways, um, so you buy a bunch of like NVIDIA calls, right? And and when the market rallies a lot over the course of a year, those calls go very deep in the money and the value of those calls expands a lot, right? Obviously, because the stock is going higher, the calls are going deep in the money, the value of those calls increase. So that's what's happening here. A lot of lot leaps were in place. The market rallied really sharply, just as it did in 2021. And so you have this, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars worth of calls set to expire now in January. Um, and very small on the put side. Well, we talked about 2021 before, and I think the analogy is really fascinating. The black line is where we are right now, uh, roughly 4,600 in the S&P. And if you look at the timing of where we were in December of 2021, this is the same S&P price that we had in December of 2021, just days before the CPI, like we are in the FOMC and expiration, excuse me, the exact same setup. Uh, what's fascinating, obviously, is, and I included a little snip of the chart here, the, the, the December 15th CPI came in at 6.8, um, which was the you know record CPI print uh, for, for that time and rates were zero back then, right? Now they're 5%. So it's a different environment. Um, and it, it, it kind of puts the analogy or the idea that higher rates hurt stocks kind of to rest, I guess, because we're back at that high. Um, but this is where we are essentially in 2021. And so you could see that after FOMC and into OPEX, we had some weakness, which is arguably what I'd forecast here, I think, because of these expiration positions rolling away. So you know, look, we drift back to this 4,600 level in 2021, and then we snap off this 200 handle S&P rally. So it's a massive rally from, call it a couple of days before Christmas into end of year. Um, and I think this idea of volatility really expanding is what we're setting up here. 
I think it's up to Powell whether or not we rip or die here or, or sell off. Um, you know, who knows what he's going to say. There's a lot of shifting, you know, rate uh, estimates, et cetera. But everything lines up the same way. The other thing is that and a, and a, you can see on this chart here this massive January expiration. We did a, a story about this in January of 2021. We called it the deep January expiration where we flagged these calls that were set to expire. And as you can see, the we hit the all-time high in 2022 uh, at 4,800. I think that was on the first day of trading. And then after that, the S&P 500 fell like a stone, fell from roughly 4,800 down to um, 4,300 at its lows. So, you know, that's an 8 eight to 10% drop in the S&P 500. And I think that was largely exacerbated by these giant call positions that are set to expire. So if we rally here at a December expiration uh, into the end of the year, that increases the value of all these calls. And I think it makes the chances that we sell off hard into January. I think it significantly elevates the odds of a sell-off in January, right? Because those calls are only going to gain in value. Conversely, if we sell off rather sharply into January, that destroys those call values that are set for January and, and I think really defangs, right, or or takes the energy out of those positions. So there's some path dependency to the to the effect here. Uh, but my takeaway is, and, and, you know, when we do our what worked, right, for January expiration, um, if we rally into the end of December, I will be looking for a pretty sharp sell for, for January. And, you know, that's kind of what my what worked <laughs> review will be, our, uh, you know, in, uh, in, in our next a segment of this. Um, so, you know, the unknowns over the next two days, obviously, CPI and FOMC, uh, we're priced for perfection arguably here. Some say that doesn't matter what Powell says just because end of year flows will make us close at the highs anyways. Um, I'm not necessarily yet in that camp. I think that you can have a tradable rally here or a tradable move either way into end of year. Um, but there, there could be a really nice short setup coming uh, to January if we if we rally rallying to the end of the year here. I'm just curious, how do you think about that macro stuff? Because obviously that's not, that is a big impact on the market and it kind of fights these flows, but also it, it's kind of a completely different thing, like outside of, you know, what you can model with options. So like, how do you think, like as an options guy, how do you think about the macro stuff? I, I think of the options market as a voting machine and volatility is a voting machine. And so, you know, um, the, the macro environment, I think is very challenging to call. We've been, you know, if you look at, I remember, you know, early 2023, I think, or 2022, rather, they were calling for rate cuts in mid, you know, to late 2022. And so like the rate cut thing keeps getting rolled out. And I think there was a, people were pricing cuts for January. I don't think it's being cut, you know, process and, and, and the TARP and our TRP or what are the liquidity monitors? It's like, that stuff changes like every day. And so, you know, I don't envy guys on the macro side who are trying to call this sort of stuff. Um, at the end of the day, you have all these institutions, hedge funds, et cetera, using options to express their position and express their views. And so whatever they think of macro, whatever the consensus is for macro is showing up in the S&P or, or in, in options positions just in general, right? Um, and so I think you can see that in single stocks. For example, when we were talking about, you know, why are call positions dying out in the mag sevens or, you know, why are call positions picking up in IWMs? You know, that's an expression of people thinking rates are going to stop. So I think you can look at, it's helpful to know the macro uh, events that are coming up so you can say, okay, I know this is what's happening, but what are, how are options positioned really around it? What does volatility look like around it? Implied volatility being very low right now tells you that people are really are not worried at all about any kind of a rate increase. You know, we could argue maybe we're off sides for that position. Um, but if people thought that rates were going to be a concern, then CPI would have a much higher implied volatility tied to it tomorrow. FOMC would have a much higher implied volatility tied to it, right? Much higher range, trading range, estimated trading range. And the fact is they don't. So people are very complacent right now. Um, and I think are just looking for the all clear to 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 buy more stocks. Like that. that's what it seems to be like uh, set up here. And so I... I I think the macro is tough because not only can you get the data right, you don't also don't necessarily get the reaction to the data right either, right? You could think that like Friday's jobs number that just came out arguably wasn't that great, um, but market still rallied, right? So, you know, that it's the reaction to the news, it's the positioning around the news um, that I think 
matters most and that's how i read it is it like it's like a probabilities thing almost so you can you say like i can't predict what's going to happen with cpi but i can see in the options market you know what might happen in either case based on how people are set up like going into it yeah that that's that's exactly right and so options at the end of the day an options price is just an expression of how much you think the market is going to move it's a bet on volatility and yes if you buy a call you're betting on volatility kind of going up rather than down but at the end of the day it's a voting machine and so sometimes you know, you look at prices in the market and, and the prices are extreme because of fear or emotions or because of people, you know, having demand to hedge. They need to hedge, right? It's like when the VIX is at 100, that's fear from people buying puts, like because they have to hedge, they don't have a choice. So that that, ex, that expands the probabilities or extends them, you know, arguably too much. Um, and then me, maybe with GameStop, right? Like things got so crazy that you couldn't necessarily have moves that equated to 400 percent implied vol like it just couldn't sustain itself so when you look at the price of the s p or if you look at the price of options excuse me around cpi or fomc you know there are times where it gets a little bit too cheap obviously or it can be too expensive and and there's some opportunity for you know i would i would, I would argue alpha around those but you know in general you're you're getting a sense of what the market is pricing in in terms of risk and if you think that's wrong either too high or too low well then you have a trade right and and you and you arguably should put a trade on, right? If you think the market's pricing something in incorrectly. But I think in general, the market prices stuff pretty efficiently. That's, that's the market's job. Um, and so the fact that, look, vol's so low right now um, tells you that people aren't worried about rate hikes in the near term. And I, and I think that even if we just pause, you know, there's still just a rally because that's how people are positioned. Um, and I think most of us, if we would have thought that rates were at 5%, we wouldn't have the S&P back at 4,500 or 4,600 anyways, right? Like if we were sitting back in December, 2021 and said, hey, you know, 6.8% CPI is nothing. Add on Ukraine war, add on war in the Middle East, add on 5% Fed funds rates or whatever. Do you think the S&P is going to be, you know, at the same level in two years? I think all of us would probably say no. I mean, maybe I'm wrong on that, but... um no, you're, you're you definitely right. I mean, that's the the one thing you learn in markets is they humble you. Like, you know, all the experts going into this year, you know, thought we were going down, you know, and, and basically we've had a, we've had a huge up year. So it's like it just throws the show. Like, it's it's very very hard. Like, this game will humble you trying trying to trade markets, whether you're a long term investor or a short term investor. It's hard no matter what. Yeah, yeah, I I couldn't I couldn't agree more. And I think uh, you know we're we're the same age. We're in our forties here, and so we've we've lived long enough to experience enough to to, you know, be pretty humble around all this sort of stuff. And, um, you know, I, I find the macro stuff very, very tricky to, to just read about much as I have to forecast myself. Um, so, so to me, I, I guess it's sort of a, maybe a lazy expression of saying, I'm just going to fall back and looking how people are positioned. Occasionally, I feel like the market is wrong, but generally I think the market's pretty efficient. Um, and, you know, right now I think volatility is not priced the right way because it's too low in my in my view. So I know positions are going to change. I don't have a great view on which direction those positions are. Maybe we rally or maybe we fall down, but, you know, volatility expanding is arguably one way to make a bet, right? I can bet that volatility is going to move by buying options. Um, yeah. My, and if you're long, how long do you want to be? Well, if volatility is going to expand and you're long, then this is a good time for, you know, betting on a, a major rally into the end of the year, right? Uh, whereas sometimes the options market's not poised to sort of help you in that in that position, regardless of what the macro setup is. So now the options market is supporting volatility. Pal is going to trigger us, and uh, we should have a pretty nice move into the end of the year. Yeah, my forty uh, five year old self has had to accept the fact that with the, my twenty five year old self thought I was going to be the next Warren Buffett, and that's not going to work <laughs> out for me. So uh, <laughs> it's been a humbling experience. I thought like after those first couple of years it was me, but uh, it turns out it's not. So uh, I mean, what is, uh, what's that stat? Like Warren Buffett made most of his money like from. 60 to 80 or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, a huge portion, you know, be of his returns one, or whatever. But. He certainly had great returns over time, but the, the biggest advantage Warren Buffett has had has been time. I mean, there's been people who have had better returns than Warren Buffett, but Warren Buffett has been doing this, you know, when, when you have like 70 years or whatever his, you know, time frame is, you're going to get like a lot of compounding over 70 years. So he's, he's always the example of, you know, if you have just a massive time frame, you know, you, you could do pretty well. Right. And the S&P making new highs for basically every year he's ever lived uh, is also helpful. Because I, I think if you if he was in like England or something, you know, where the markets haven't arguably done as well and it would change, arguably would have changed things. So the point is the same that convex is really helpful. But my my 
my point though, Jack, is that you have plenty of time to uh, have convexity work in your favor. Oh, that is true. Yeah, maybe if I if I live to be a hundred, we get some advances in technology or something. I've still got a lot of compounding ahead of me. <laughs> that's right. Well, that's probably <laughs> that's probably a good thing to wrap up on. Um, compounding was a word I worked for. I said convexity, but I meant compounding. I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, thank you for everybody, everybody for joining us. Um, please, if if you do, if you made it to the end here, I don't know how many people did, but uh, like <laughs> everybody did. Well, like and subscribe on YouTube. Let's get this thing. Uh, if I want to be the next Warren Buffett, I'm going to need a lot of views. So uh, please, please help Brett and I out. Um, and, and we'll see everybody next week or next next uh, month, I guess. Next month, a lot will happen by then. Yeah. This is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube or leave a review or a comment. We appreciate it. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Olivia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Olivia Capital.